Good morning on this Easter and Passover weekend. I'm Martha Raddatz. As we take a look at thousands flocking to St. Peter's Square this morning to celebrate with Pope Francis. And we'll have new details on his visit to Philadelphia coming up. But we start off with the new terror threats from Yemen to the U.S. that have officials so concerned right now, including a new threat from the jihadist group that launched that deadly attack on a college campus this week. Kenyan police now saying one of the gunmen was the son of a government officer. Chief investigator of correspondent Brian Ross tracking all of it. Good morning, Brian. Well, good morning, Martha. American officials this morning are analyzing this new set of terror threats after an unsettling week of attacks, arrests, and anarchy that raise questions of whether the anti-terror strategy of the U.S. and its allies is up to the task. The new threats come from the same Al-Qaeda-connected terrorist in Africa who this week killed 148 people, mostly students, at Garissa University College in Kenya. Christians were executed on the spot, according to survivors. The gunshot continued, and this made us to run to the fence so that we can uh, get our way out from the school. The massacre was carried out by the group called Al-Shabaab that the U.S. has been targeting for years in its home base of Somalia. But the scenes of carnage made it clear whatever is being done to stop Al-Shabaab has not succeeded. At home, the FBI is claiming it succeeded after the arrest of two young women in New York who agents said idolized al-Qaeda and ISIS, studied bomb-making online, and wanted to be part of what they told an undercover agent would be the last war, the big war, Armageddon, inside the U.S. Neighbors in Brooklyn expressed shock. It's incredible. I can't believe it. But nothing this week concerned U.S. officials more than the anarchy in Yemen, where al-Qaeda carried out a massive prison break, freeing some 300 of its fighters. One of the escapees even posted pictures of himself inside a plush palace office in the area. No group poses a more direct threat to the U.S. than the Al-Qaeda in Yemen network. Its evil genius bomb maker has repeatedly targeted U.S. bound aircraft with bombs hidden in shoes, underwear, printers. So there's no reason to think that that hasn't stopped. In fact, given the situation in Yemen, I think we have to be concerned that they're able to make those arrangements, make those plans without any real interference from Yemeni security forces because of the chaos inside that country. All of this in Yemen, in Kenya, and here in the U.S. highlights the serious limitations faced by the U.S. in trying to stop the dangerous spread and reach of radical Islamist groups prepared to kill anyone who serves their agenda or gets in their way. Martha? Thanks, Brian. Let's take this on now with Michael Leiter, former director of the National Counterterrorism Center for both Presidents Bush and Obama, and Congressman Adam Schiff, top Democrat on the Intelligence Committee. And I want to start with you, Congressman Schiff, and tell us what you know about the latest concerning Yemen and Kenya. Well, in Yemen, the news is really all bad, just as we feared in the chaos between this fight with the Houthis and now the Saudi intervention. Uh, Al-Qaeda has had a resurgence. They've taken over uh, the fifth largest town in Yemen, uh, sprung Al-Qaeda uh, operatives from prison. A couple hundred people were still trying to ascertain just who was released in that prison break. They've also taken over part of a bank and now have added financial resources. Uh, so that chaos is providing just the kind of fertile ground and environment for AQAP to, to grow again. Is it a safe haven now? It seems like it certainly is. Oh, it's absolutely a safe haven. It was a safe haven before, and now it's more than a safe haven. It's really wide open. And it's not just wide open for al-Qaeda, but it really is a new battlefield for sectarian tension in the region. And I think what that means is we're not going to have this under control for quite some time with the outside forces now playing into it. And, and we have to remember, this is truly the most dangerous place for terrorists as far as America is concerned. This is. This is the group that has been most sophisticated, most advanced, and most focused on attacking the United States. It was the underwear bomber. It was a printer cartridge bomber. This is a very sophisticated group that is committed to fighting outside of Yemen, not just in Yemen. And, and our counterterrorism policy, Congressman Schiff, is it the right one? The administration keeps defending it, even in Yemen, which is complete chaos now. It is complete chaos. Uh, you know, it's the right one when compared to the alternative of a massive American occupation. We're not going to do another Afghanistan. We're not going to fully occupy Yemen or every other country where there's a significant terrorist problem. That doesn't mean that the administration strategy is uh, flawless, however. And I think had we put greater emphasis and resources uh, in trying to deal with the governance issues uh, in Yemen, this might have been prevented and might. Uh, there's no guarantee here. Uh, but it just shows that we need a kind of a whole of government approach. It can't be simply counterterrorism. We have to look at some of the underlying tribal and governance problems as well. And, and let, let's go to Kenya for a moment here, Michael. The thing that's astonishing about Kenya is how few gunmen it took to kill so many people. Well, Kenya is better off than is Yemen in terms of having security forces that can combat al-Shabaab, which aligned with al-Qaeda several years back. But ultimately, you still have really ungoverned areas. South of Somalia is controlled by this al-Qaeda-oriented group. 
And the Kenyan border and Kenyan police and Kenyan security services just don't have the ability to protect the nation the way they need to. And what we're seeing in Kenya, what we saw in Yemen, whenever you have these ungoverned places, whenever you have corruption in government, you can, with just a few people, really cause disastrous havoc. And, and let me jump to Syria. This is The whole world is really in trouble in that part of the world. In Syria, you've got ISIS taking over a huge refugee camp. It's really uh, unimaginable what the people in this refugee camp must be going through. There are reports now of the beheading of people there. Uh, this camp was already, I think, in very dire straits with a variety of uh, Islamist groups taking over. You had an al-Nusra presence already. You had other rebel fighters there. Now you have ISIS taking over, really probably because this is low-hanging fruit for ISIS. Uh, not very well secure, not very well guarded, and they can wreak their mayhem there. Uh, it may be a sign, though, also that ISIS is under increasing pressure uh, in Iraq, as we see with the defeat in Tikrit, uh, but also in, in other parts of uh, Iraq and Syria. So this may be a way of showing they're still powerful, they're still dangerous, and they are. And, and Michael, very quickly, just what, what do you do? Well, first of all, now that things are so bad throughout this region, it's much harder. But what we see is our Sunni allies being much more forceful, taking the lead, frankly, without the United States. I think we have to re-win their confidence. We have to re-engage. And we have to accept that we can't keep these things isolated inside the borders. It is bleeding out through the, throughout the region. And that's a huge problem for the United States security and for our allies. Thanks very much to both of you.